uh, we, we need to look at Paul. And again, we'll approach Paul the same way as we did Jesus, looking at the rule before the exception. This is so important. If you focus entirely on the exception, you get a distorted view. And for Paul, the rule is very simple. Only death dissolves a marriage. Same rule. And this comes out very clearly in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, where he simply says that if a woman marries someone else while her husband is still alive, she is an adulteress. It's as simple as that. And again at the end of 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, the same statement. But that rule, of course, has a positive side. And that is that death does dissolve a marriage. And that uh, a person who has been bereaved, a married person, is then totally free to remarry. Not only that, in the New Testament they are urged to remarry, especially widows, especially if they're younger widows. And Paul urges them to find a new husband. So death dissolves the marriage and widow, widows and widowers are totally free to remarry. Though Paul adds, if they're a Christian, they're only free to marry, remarry in the Lord. In other words, another Christian. But that's the rule. So Romans 7, 1 to 3, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. But 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10 to 11. I've already mentioned it in connection with Jesus, but let me repeat it. Paul is here speaking about this very issue. And he says, not I, but the Lord. In other words, he is quoting Jesus' teaching. And here he makes a categorical statement a wife must not separate from her husband, and a husband must not separate from the wife. And the word separate here is virtually the same word as the word divorce. And he's saying it just must not happen. In between those two categorical statements is a third statement which we must look at fairly carefully. I believe the New International Version has got it wrong, but you'll have to check me out if you can in the Greek. The New International Version, in between saying the wife must not separate from the husband and the husband must not separate from the wife, puts in this little qualification, but if she does, let her remain single or be reconciled. As much as to say that Paul is allowing separation in some circumstances. And it seems an apparent contradiction. She must not separate, but if she does... The one thing that is clear is that she has only two options if she does, either remaining single or be reconciled, which again underlines an absolute no remarriage if he's quoting Jesus. The thing that I think the NIV has got wrong is the tense of the verb, if she does. The actual tense of the verb is past tense, if she is already separated. And throughout this chapter, Paul is talking about people's conditions when they become Christians, to remain in the calling in which they're called, to stay in the situation in which they are. And I think he's saying here, a wife must not separate from her husband. That's a Christian principle. But if she's already separated when she came to Christ, what does she do? She remains single or she's reconciled. Actually, if the wife does separate later, I think the same rule applies. The options are remain single or be reconciled. And I was counseling a couple just a month or two back, lovely Christian couple, both love the Lord, contemplating divorce. And uh, I said to them, so you're both prepared to remain single for the rest of your lives. And their jaws dropped. Oh, no. No, no. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean? I said, here's the verse. If Christians separate, they remain single or be reconciled. I said, that's your option. And they said, oh, no. They said, there are plenty of people who are second marriages in our church. Actually, before I left that couple, I said to them, do you know what you're both telling me? You're both telling me you've each already met someone you intend to, remarry, to marry after you've split up. And that was the truth, and they were both Christians, keen evangelicals. But they both met somebody else they preferred. And that's why they were getting divorced. And most divorces today, I think, 
are in that category. People get divorced to remarry, have a second go. Well, now, that's 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11. Paul is clearly repeating the Lord's prohibition of remarriage. However, in the same chapter, people claim that he makes an exception. And though the chapter begins and ends with a categorical uh, upholding of the rule only death dissolves a marriage, in between there are two passages which have been understood to mean exceptions. The first is verse 12 to verse 16, which begins, not the Lord, but I. That doesn't alter the truth of it for me, but he's making it quite clear that he's now not passing on Jesus' teaching, but he's giving his own apostolic counsel, which to me has the same authority in Scripture, but uh, some scholars think, therefore, now we're only into Paul's opinion. However, he still begins with commanding language, must not. And he now talks about unequal yokes. A marriage where there's a believer and an unbeliever. Elsewhere he has said that must never happen. A believer should not marry an unbeliever. But here he's presuming that there will be marriages where one person becomes a Christian before the other. In other words, something that has happened before either became a Christian. We're not discussing now marriages between believers and unbelievers, which personally I could never conduct. It's against the will of the Lord, but nevertheless, there are such marriages. It's most likely to have arisen because usually the wife has been converted before the husband. And the husband, who never intended to be married to a Christian, wakes up in bed one morning and finds there's a Christian in bed with him. And he doesn't like it one bit. Now Paul says in that situation, the believer must never institute divorce proceedings, must never separate from the unbeliever. That marriage is holy in God's sight, and therefore in a, a limited sense, the unbeliever is sanctified by the believer. And then Paul adds a very telling argument. He said, if you separate from your husband because he's an unbeliever, you've got to separate from your kids too. Because they're not believers yet. Which settles it, I think, conclusively. But now he adds this, supposing the unbeliever wants out and just cannot stand being in a house with a Christian, which I know can be only too real. And the unbeliever said, I didn't marry a Christian. I don't want to be involved with a Bible thumper and a churchgoer. And the situation just becomes worse and worse, usually with the unbeliever persecuting the believer. And it's just anything but harmony and peace in that house. And Paul actually says to the believer, let them go. If they really want out, since God is a God of peace and there's no peace in your house, let them go. Don't try and hold on to them. Now, of course, I know from situations I've counseled like this, the believer believes they have a, a profound duty to hold the marriage together, if only for the sake of the conversion of the unbeliever. And there's almost a desperate sense of, before God, I've got to hold this marriage together. And Paul says, no, you don't. Let it go. God wants peace. And if it's going to be impossible to have peace in your home, that's a libel on God. Now, that's quite a profound thing to say. But then, having said that, the believer should let the unbeliever go if they're determined and wish to, and not try and hold it together. And Paul actually says, how do you know if you'll be the means of salvation to him? You don't. So that's not a reason for holding on like grim death to an impossible situation. Let them go. But now comes the question, having let the unbeliever go, is the believer free to remarry? And Paul has made a statement here that, again, can be understood in many ways. But he says, the believer is not bound. And since... In English, the word bound is used everywhere else for the marriage bond. It is assumed that Paul is saying here 
they are released from the marriage bond. If the unbeliever is departed, they are now released from the marriage bond and therefore free to remarry. There are two problems with that interpretation, though many take it, usually from the English version. The first problem is that the verb is not the verb that Paul always uses for bound in marriage. It's actually the word enslaved. And Paul never uses that word of marriage, never. Marriage is a bond, yes, a bond voluntary entered into. It's a binding thing, but it's not slavery. A wife is not a slave to a husband, a husband is not a slave to a wife. That is a total misunderstanding of marriage. So why does Paul use the word slaved here? The second problem is that this verb is in, to give you a bit of professional Greek for a moment, it is in the perfect tense, which means something that happened in the past, which goes on having an effect in the present. You with me? Christ crucified is usually in the perfect tense, meaning he was crucified in the past, but the cross goes on affecting the present. Do you, do you follow me? And the word he is saying here is, for you were not enslaved. He's talking about the past, not the future. He's talking about the marriage. He's saying, that didn't bind you with the bonds of a slave. You were not enslaved. He's not saying you are now free. He is saying you were not enslaved to each other. And you mustn't even think that way. Because the thinking, I must hold on to this marriage, is really a slavish bond. Are you following me? In fact, Paul does not discuss here at all the question of whether the believer is now free to remarry. And I'm quoting what I think is the best and one of the latest commentaries on 1 Corinthians by a very fine Pentecostal scholar called Gordon Fee. Has any of you heard of Gordon Fee? And Gordon Fee's conclusion here is, this does not say anything about remarriage. Paul is simply discussing what happens if the unbeliever wants out. The answer is let him go, for you were not enslaved to him when you married. He is not saying, you are now free to go and find someone else. He doesn't even discuss that. And so I would conclude from this that verses 12 to 16 do not give an exception for remarriage. The trouble is that when people say this is an exception, as they do, John Stott does um, in his book on the subject. When you say that, if an unbeliever can desert and leave you free to remarry, what if a believer deserts you? Are you not then also free? And once again, the one exception begins to spread and spread and spread. I'm just throwing this out. That's not a, a conclusive argument. But those who do accept that Paul has made an exception to remarriage, don't stop with this. Very difficult to stop. If a believer has done the deserting, doesn't that apply as well? You see what I'm getting at then? I'm trying to communicate today that there's a huge difference between an absolute and a relative, between no exception and one exception, or even two. There's a huge difference, and it's awfully difficult to maintain a relative standard. Not impossible, it's very difficult. Now the other passage in 1 Corinthians 7, which people have said is an exception, looks the most like one. The context is, let everyone remain in the situation he was in when God called him. And Paul is laying this on fairly thick, and he's saying, if you were a slave, when God called you, stay a slave. If you were single, stay single. If you were married, Stay married. And then he says this. If you were unmarried, or the word is, if you were separated, stay separated. But if you marry, you have not sinned. Now, 
you must read these passages for yourselves. But he says, are you married? Don't seek divorce. Are you separated? Don't look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And again at first glance, taking this verse by itself, he is saying to the divorced, if you do marry, you're not sinning. And on that has been built a huge list of exceptions. Uh, because he doesn't say on what ground you were separated. He just says, are you separated? Don't seek to be married, but if you do, you haven't sinned. Now then, either this is a complete blank check for all divorcees to remarry, which would contradict everything else we've found in Scripture thus far. Or, when he says, are you demarried, that's the word almost, um, he is thinking of those whose partners have died. Because literally it is, have you been freed from marriage? Now you can take that as meaning divorce, in which case any divorce he can remarry, or you can take it in consistency with everything else he says in this chapter, that it's someone whose partner has died. And he's telling them that they're perfectly free to remarry. It's not sin at all. Now, if we took it to mean what it apparently means out of context that any divorcee can remarry and haven't sinned then frankly there are no no rules, no exceptions but I have I didn't bring it today, I've got a book that I was looking at yesterday a Christian book by one of the most prominent authors in America on Christian counselling and he starts with verse 27 and 28 for the whole book and he says, you see from this that it's all right for divorcees to remarry. This whole book is built on that, which contradicts everything Jesus said and everything Paul says at the beginning and end of this chapter. And therefore, I can only assume that he is saying, if you are free from marriage through the death of your partner, don't seek to be married. He felt that in the circumstances of the day that it was better to be single. And he makes a big point of that all through the chapter, that in view of the current crisis, you wouldn't have the worries of a family because they are extra responsibility on you at the time of pressure. Summing up Paul then, he does not discuss remarriage at all. And we should not try and force some of the things he says into that. He quotes Jesus without making any exceptions. And his options for the separated are either remain single or be reconciled. To sum up then the whole New Testament, there are three possible positions that can be taken from the New Testament. And I'm giving you all three. I'll be quite frank about all of them. But there are three for those for whom Scripture is the last word. The first position is that scripture contains two exceptions for remarriage. One, adultery, and two, desertion by an unbeliever. That's the position taken probably by the majority of evangelicals uh, and would be represented by uh, teachers like John Stott and many others that there are two and two only exceptions and that we must apply those two rigidly uh, and not go beyond them. One is that the partner has committed adultery leaving the innocent party free to remarry and the other is that an unbeliever has deserted a believer. And probably the majority of evangelicals would say there are those two exceptions and no others. The second position is that there is one exception, that Paul doesn't deal with the question of remarriage at all and that we're twisting his words to make him make an exception and that it is highly improbable that Paul would have had the temerity to add to Jesus' teaching an exception of his own. You've got to face that one. But uh, 
I have told you frankly, I don't believe Paul did make any exception. He didn't deal with the issue. He's purely dealing with whether you have to hold the marriage together or not, which is a very different issue. Which leaves this second position that Jesus did allow one exception, namely adultery or physical infidelity, and that the innocent party is free to remarry. I have shown you that Jesus' statement, the only verse in which he apparently said that, is ambiguous. And so the third position, which we may adopt from the New Testament, is that there are no exceptions to the remarriage rule at all. And that as long as a person's partner is still alive, they are not free to remarry. They may divorce on the ground that Jesus allowed, but they are not free to take another partner. Well, those are the three possible positions based on the New Testament. I don't think there are any others based on what is actually said. I'll say later how Christians have persuaded them, Bible-believing Christians have persuaded themselves there are more exceptions, but I'm just saying that I believe those three are the only possible positions if we take the New Testament seriously. Either two exceptions, one or none. And I've been quite frank that it is the third position that seems to me the one that Jesus actually took though I'm not going to be dogmatic and say it's the only possible. I think the first position of two exceptions is improbable. I think the second, one exception, is possible. I think the third is probable, no exceptions. Now that's where I am. Having said all that, the majority of pastoral situations that come up don't fit any of those three positions. And there comes the problem, which we're going to deal with in the third session. The vast majority of divorces today don't come within those. They are people, both unbelievers and believers, falling out of love, or falling in love with someone else. Just getting to the point they can't stand each other, and off they go. And I'm tempted to tell you of one situation that I had to counsel, which illustrates the value of a word of wisdom. That's a gift of the Spirit. A couple came to me after a meeting in London, lovely little couple, quite young, and they said, Mr. Pawson, if you don't help us, we're getting divorced. And I said, are you both Christians? They said, yes. I said, you both love the Lord? Yes. And you're going to get divorced? Why are you thinking about divorce? They said, we can't stand each other. I said, how long have you been married? They said, three months. I said, that's pretty quick. I said, how did you ever meet each other? And then it all came out. She volunteered to be a prison visitor. And uh, they foolishly sent her to a man's prison. I mean, asking girls to counsel fellas, you're inviting Satan in. And vice versa. And so she met this boy and she led him to the Lord. There's no question that he was converted. And she discipled him in the prison cell over months. He was in for a serious crime. And there's no doubt he grew, he developed, he matured as a disciple. But the inevitable happened. They became quite fond of each other. The day finally came when he was released and she said, where are you going to go? And he said, I don't know. I have no friends or relatives. I have no home. I don't know where to go. She was a single girl in her late 20s with her own apartment. She was alone in the world too. So... You can guess the rest. As soon as he got out of jail, they went and got a quickie marriage and moved into her apartment together as Christians. And then they found that in every other way they were totally incompatible. When he undressed, he just dropped his trousers on the floor and left them there. In the morning, just put his feet in them and pulled them up. Very efficient. And uh, he, he, he'd never used a knife and fork, ate with his fingers, in just every way. She'd been brought up nicely with lace curtains and flowers and everything in the drawer. And After three months, they could not stand each other. And they said, if you don't help us, we're getting divorced. I said, Lord, please give me a word of wisdom. I've only got five minutes. And uh, the Lord did. I said, now listen carefully. You're to do week on, week off. And they said, what does that mean? I said, now listen carefully. The first week, you both do things his way. 
And you, the girl, you must learn to throw your clothes on the floor and learn to eat with your fingers. But the next week, you're both to do things her way. And you're to learn to put your clothes away in the drawer and you're to learn to use a knife and fork. Then the next week, you go back to... And they looked at me, they said, that's so weird, it's got to be of the Lord. <laughs> and they said, is that all? I said, that's all. And off they went. And I've not seen them from that day to this. But six months later, I got the most lovely letter. Dear Mr. Porson, we never thought marriage could be so wonderful. <laughs> we are blissfully happy. <laughs> and they went on like this. I've kept the letter. It brings tears to my eyes just to read it. The only thing is they never told me if they were still doing it. <laughs> and you see, I can now write a book on marriage entitled Week on, Week Off. <laughs> but I have never told anyone else to do that. Because that was a word of wisdom for those two. But thank God they're not divorced. Well, I just threw that in. We've come to the end of our Bible study. It's been a rushed one even so. And we've skipped over and you need to go back and back over those passages in the light of what I've said. But I think you've got the feel of the problem we have now. How on earth do you begin to apply any of those three positions to the pastoral scene today. So we come to historical practice, our second subject. We're dealing now with tradition, which for me does not have the same authority as scripture. However, I think it is important to know how other Christians interpret scripture. Before I write a book on anything, and I'm trying to write a book on this subject now, before I do, I read as many other books as possible, especially those that take a different viewpoint. I think it's very important to always hear the other side. It helps you to re-examine your own positions to how strong or weak it may be, and it's very important to hear how others have understood Scripture. And that, to me, is the place of tradition. It doesn't decide it for me, but at least it means I'm not left alone in how I'm reading the Bible. I'm really listening to others as well. I think that's important. For the simple reason that no Bible teacher is infallible. I sometimes say to Roman Catholic priests, you know, the thing I most admire about your church is that you only have one infallible teacher. I said, we Protestants have hundreds. <laughs> Almost every pastor is an infallible pope. And you'd be amazed how often people come to me and say, so-and-so doesn't teach that. And they name another known Bible teacher. I say, let's go back to the Bible. Do you just believe everything that teacher says? Or do you check him out? And I say now to all of you, if you can't find what I'm saying in your Bible for yourself, forget it. I'm concerned to help you to reach your convictions and not to be persuaded that I've got it all tied up. I haven't. I'm still learning. But I've revealed where I'm at at the moment and in which direction I'm moving. Well, now, we're all influenced by tradition. We tend to adopt the views of our particular group or denomination or church or pastor. But I believe every Christian has a duty to think for themselves and to check it out. And the two channels by which you check it out are the scripture and the spirit but we do need to listen to each other and that's the point of looking now i'm going to look at four periods the last two thousand years in this subject divides very clearly into four distinct phases in which the church has taken different views first is the first 500 years what i've called the early view the view of the first five centuries and we have many church fathers, as they're called, who've written things during that period, and so we have their views. Then we're going to look at the next thousand years, which I've called the medieval phase. And there was a radical shift for that thousand years. Very big change. Then we come to the uh, next three centuries, which I'm calling the Reformed period, not because there weren't any others, but because from the Protestant Reformation on, a new line on divorce and remarriage was taken. 
the uh, Orthodox and Catholic churches stayed with where they were in the medieval period. But the reformers branched out in a new direction, which is still probably the major Protestant position today. Then I'm going to look at what's happened in the last century, the 20th century, the modern phase, which frankly has been more different than any previous age in this issue. So we begin with the first 500 years, sometimes called the classic period. They were, of course, closest to the New Testament in time. And therefore, not infallibly, but possibly, nearest to the apostolic understanding, nearest to the days of the early church and the apostles. There are not too many references, and they can be interpreted in different ways and have been by different scholars, but there does seem to be a clear picture emerges. And for those of you who are familiar with any of the church fathers, I have found quotations from Hermas, Justin Martyr, Athenagoras, Theophilus of Antioch, Irenaeus, Clement, Oregon, Tertullian, um, Basil of Ankara and Basil of Caesarea, Gregory Nazianzus, Apollinaris, Theodore, Chrysostom, Chrysostom Theodoret, Epiphanes, Ambrose, Innocent I, Pelagius, Jerome, Leo the Great, and Augustine. Now some of those names may mean something to some of you. Most of them probably mean nothing. And I'm not just into name dropping. All but one of those names took the same position. Twenty-five church fathers from this first five centuries and two church councils, one in Arles in France and the other in Elvira. So we have 25 church fathers and two church councils, all saying the same thing. And it is that Jesus permitted divorce for adultery, but prohibited all remarriage. Now that's a pretty solid testimony. There is only one voice in that period that took a different viewpoint. And he's had a lot of publicity. He's called Ambrosiasta in the middle of the 4th century. And Ambrosiastra, he said, an innocent husband who has divorced his wife for adultery can remarry. Surprisingly, he said, an innocent wife can't, which would seem a little inconsistent. But he was the only voice in the first five centuries that permitted remarriage for anyone, and then for husbands only, and only after divorce for adultery. So that's the position. I don't think I'm going to give you all the quotes that I've written down. For example, Hermas, the shepherd of Hermas is his writing, and he said, let the husband send the wife persisting in adultery away and let the husband remain single. Uh, Justin Martyr, those who contract double marriages are sinning against our master. Athenagoras, abide in one marriage and no more. And so it goes on. Remarriage is fornication, says Clement. Well, you can only take my word for it, but uh, I can give you documentary things to look up if you're interested. That's a pretty solid, consistent picture of those who lived nearest to the time of Jesus and the apostles. And it's divorce for adultery only. No remarriage, whatever. Now we come to the next thousand years in which there was a radical development and change in understanding marriage and therefore in attitudes to divorce and remarriage. Not only was there a radical development as we shall see, but there was a radical divergence between two halves of the church, one in the east and the other in the west. It culminated, as you may know, in a complete split in the year 1054, and the Eastern churches hived off and called themselves Orthodox. In other words, we claim to have the truth. And the church in the West called itself Catholic, which means universal or all-embracing. So you had two churches now, one of which claimed to have the truth, and the other claimed to be everybody's church. 
and it has remained that way until today. But the split began earlier than 1054, and it was largely political, because the Roman Empire had split. Or rather, the emperor had left Rome and shifted his capital to what we now call Istanbul, which was renamed after that emperor Constantinople. And so now you had a church which was based in Rome, but the empire had shifted to the east and was later to be called the Byzantine Empire. So the church was now very tied up with the state. The emperor presided at church councils. It's a debate as to whether it was a good thing that Constantine got converted. I think it was the biggest disaster ever. But church and state became one. But now church was centered on Rome and state was centered on Constantinople. It wasn't long before the bishop of Constantinople said, I'm number one. And bishop of Rome is number two. Because I'm where the emperor is. And in fact it became a political battle between the two. The ultimate split, if you're interested, came over one little clause in the creed called the Filioque Clause because it was about the Son and it was in the creed it says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. And then the Bishop of Rome wrote in and the Son. But because the Bishop of Constantinople hadn't written it in <laughs> and hadn't been consulted, there was a huge argument about this little phrase and the sun. And that was eventually the argument over which the big split came. And though people say, why split the church over three words and the sun? It was more than theological, it was political. But it was theological. I won't go into it fully. But you see, the Western church believed the Holy Spirit came from the Father and the Son in time. Whereas the Eastern Church, which is more philosophical, thought they meant in eternity. And they couldn't accept that. But be it as it may, it's split. But there has been a complete difference on divorce and remarriage between East and West ever since. They diverged in this second thousand years. Now, how did they diverge? They diverged primarily because Augustine, that dreadful man, I fear he's done more damage to the church than anybody other because I'm writing a book called Degreasing the Church because it was Augustine who reframed the Christian faith in a Greek framework. He introduced the word ideal. And this platonic approach had profound effects, one of which was that the Greeks never could get spiritual and physical things together. And for Augustine, even sex within marriage was concupiscence. And that, from that sprang the celibate priesthood in the West and the Western church's complete muddle over sex, which we've suffered from ever since. But the main thing Augustine did, unfortunately, he read his Bible in Latin and not Greek. A version that was called the Vulgate, produced by a man called Jerome in Bethlehem. And that is the official version of the Catholic Church ever since. And when he read the Latin in Ephesians 5, it didn't read like the Greek. The Greek in Ephesians 5 said, Now marriage is a mystery of Christ and his church. But in the Latin version, it doesn't say mystery or mysterion, as the Greek word is. It says, Now marriage is a sacramentum. And Augustine said, So marriage is a sacrament. Now that was to change the whole Western Church's thinking about marriage. Other sacraments were also added. Now Protestants believe in two sacraments, the Lord's Supper and Baptism, but Catholics believe in seven, as you know, right through to extreme unction. And all. But marriage is one of them, from Augustine's teaching. Now if marriage is a sacrament like baptism, it can't ever be repeated. Furthermore, it can't ever be dissolved. The grace given in marriage as a sacrament is permanent. It can't ever be removed from the persons to whom it has been given. 
the grace given in marriage stays. Are you following me in this? Therefore, marriage is indissoluble under any circumstances at all. Now, what change was this from the early 500 years? The change was that in the first 500 years, they said marriage should not be dissolved. But Augustine said it cannot be dissolved. And that has remained the position of the Catholic Church to this day. And therefore, the Catholic Church cannot accept divorcees. They're not allowed to attend Mass. Those who've remarried after divorce. Because marriage is a sacrament. It is totally indissoluble. And it was all due to having read the wrong translation, unfortunately, but... That was the translation he had. And by that time, sacramentum had become a very special church word. It had become a word for grace mediated through a priest to the people. And only a priest could do it. Now, this, as I've said, is still the view. And therefore, the most the church could accept was separation from bed and board. In other words, Catholics can accept separation, but not remarriage. But the reason why they can't accept remarriage is now quite different. It's no longer an obligation. It is now a sacramentum. It's something that you cannot dissolve. This was developed further at the Council of Trent and by other scholars, but it's essentially still the same. However, since it is a sacrament, the indissolubility of marriage only applies to Christians. It doesn't apply to anybody else. Only baptized people is their marriage indissoluble. So, Again, officially to the Catholics, a marriage has to be between baptized people and consummated physically for it to be a marriage. They then developed a whole machinery for annulling marriages. Not divorcing them, but annulling them and declaring that they weren't a true marriage. And of course, if one of the partners wasn't baptized, it wasn't a true marriage, it wasn't a sacrament. So that's a different situation. If it wasn't consummated physically, then it wasn't a marriage. And in fact, there are now 19 grounds on which a marriage can be annulled. And I've got a book here. I've been right through it. I couldn't believe what a complicated machinery it is. But this book is to tell a Catholic how to get annulled. And, of course, the system has been abused. And you all know that Henry VIII wanted to get his first marriage annulled. And when the Pope wouldn't do it, he separated from the Pope and set himself up as head of the Church of England and annulled himself and went on doing so. Though, of course, technically, when you've chopped your wife's head off, you are free to remarry <laughs> because death has dissolved the marriage. And he, he found that an easier way later. I mean... It, it's almost a joke to us, but believe me, it tore England apart. And it laid the most shaky foundation for the Church of England that could possibly be laid. And that's one of the reasons why the Church of England is so divided on this very issue today, because it all began with Henry VIII. And what do you make of all that? But there it is. So that's the Catholic position. In practice, they are nearest to the early church in forbidding remarriage but they're doing it with an entirely different sort of thinking, which uh, personally I find impossible to accept. And annulment has been abused ever since. It has often been thought, if not said, that uh, if you really want a marriage annulled, you can get it. You're virtually getting a divorce. Now, what was happening to the Eastern Church at this time they did not insist on the indissolubility of marriage as a sacrament. And they accepted the emperor's legal rules. Justinian was the emperor who made laws on divorce and remarriage. 
And the Orthodox Church, the Bishop of Constantinople, accepted that as ruling for the church also. In other words, divorce and remarriage became legal for church as well as state, within limits. Justinian rules had limits, strict limits. Or to put it simply, divorce was justified legally as the lesser of two evils, although contrary to scripture. And so in the West, the church became tighter than the New Testament on the indissolubility of marriage. In the East, they became more liberal, following the laws of the state. And this, of course, is the problem when church and state are to so tied up together. Who's going to call the shots? Who's going to make the rules? Church or state? And we are in this position in this country right now. Is the Church of England going to abide by the laws of the land or have its own laws? Well, it does have its own canon law. Uh, that's what canon law means. Canon law means church law as opposed to civil law. And so on the whole, through the medieval period, the Orthodox Church accepted the state's stance on divorce and remarriage. And now they are the strongest church to abide by tradition and because the tradition of the Middle Ages, of the medieval period, was a laxer approach, the Orthodox Church doesn't have as tight a control of divorce and remarriage as the Western Church. They are much more understanding, quote, and uh, tend to follow tradition rather than scripture in this. Now we come to the next few centuries, which I've labeled reformed, because now there was to be a big change in the West, but in the north half of the West, in northern Europe, there was the Reformation. But throughout Europe, before the Reformation and right through it, there was a secular movement called the Enlightenment, which was to have a profound effect. It was to change from what is the will of God to what is the will of man in ethical and moral questions. Man would decide for himself. It began with an appeal to the ancient classical world, a restoration of Greek and Roman culture, a rediscovery of Greek and Roman culture. And of course, with that would come the Greek and Roman attitude to divorce and remarriage, which it did. It was a humanist movement by going back to ancient Greece and Rome, even in architecture, you can trace the Enlightenment. You can see it in buildings in London. And so they brought the ancient Greek and Roman culture and thinking right into northern Europe, whole of Europe, actually. But out of that rethinking was to come a rethinking in the religious part of the movement, the Reformation. Let me try and explain the man who linked the Enlightenment to the Protestant Reformation was a man called Erasmus, a Dutchman. He was a Christian humanist who in himself combined the Enlightenment and the Reformation. He saw that the medieval Roman church needed reforming and he wanted to reform it from within. It was only when Martin Luther split from Rome that Erasmus split from Luther. Because Erasmus wanted to be a Catholic, a reformed Catholic, and to bring the Enlightenment into the Catholic Church. One of the things he did was to translate the New Testament or recover the original Greek version of the New Testament as against the Latin. And of course, when he did, he read Ephesians 5 and realized that the word was mystery and not sacrament. And that led him to question the whole Catholic approach to marriage and therefore to divorce and remarriage. And it was that influence that influenced Luther and later Calvin and the other reformers. So from the Greek New Testament, he knew that marriage was not a sacrament and therefore not indissoluble. Erasmus was a very human man, as well as a humanist. He was humanitarian and he felt for people and he really had sympathy with people whose marriages went wrong. And so he set out to see if he couldn't possibly find a biblical basis 
for divorce and remarriage. And it was Erasmus who came up with the two exception view. And for example, John Stott in his book today would say, I take an Erasmian view. It has been called the Erasmian view ever since after this Dutchman Erasmus who said, yes, provided you were divorced over the adultery of your partner and you were innocent, you are free to remarry and provided you were married to an unbeliever who deserted you, you can be remarried. And this was the familiar two exception position which most evangelicals today still hold. And it's Erasmian. Well, of course, once he'd found those two, he didn't stop there. And soon he was arguing things like, would Christ want a wife to stay with a cruel husband who was beating her up? This is the kind of argument from the compassion of Christ, which began to extend, not too far, but from Erasmus has come this twofold exception which is almost orthodox evangelicalism today. He was influenced, you see, first by going back to the Greek, but second by sympathy for situations. And that led him in this direction. Luther accepted both those two exceptions from Erasmus. And while Luther regarded marriage as holy matrimony, he said it is not a sacrament and there was a reaction to the whole Roman Catholic approach to marriage. Luther himself, of course, married his Katie and uh, said there's nothing in the Bible against married priests. Um, but Luther himself began to extend those two exceptions and the first extension was if you've been deserted by a believer, you are now free. He did, however, also believe that the state could give divorce on other grounds and that the state should execute adulterers. He based that on the Mosaic Law. We're going to see that the Mosaic Law became a complication in Protestant circles. Calvin had a similar view but a stricter application. He spoke out against divorce by mutual consent, which had become legal by then. And Calvin's successor, Beza, became even stricter. Both of them based their views on Deuteronomy 24. Uh, something I can't go into now, it's too big. But essentially the Calvinists have pushed together the Old and the New Covenant into one covenant of grace. And that has led to confusion. You see, there are two covenants. There's one of Moses and one of Christ. If you put them together into one, you start putting yourself under Moses' law again. You start calling Sunday a Sabbath. Go to Scotland and you'll never hear the word Sunday. It's the Sabbath. And it's because of this confusion. And so from then on, people were quoting the law of Moses as the basis for Christian behavior. And while the law of Moses is part of our scripture, it is quite clear that we're not under that law or every man in this room would need to be circumcised. And Paul fought that, Judaizing. He fought for Gentile freedom. We are not Sunday observers. Sunday is not a Sabbath. It's not the fourth commandment. We're not under that. We're not under tithing. I cringe whenever I hear tithing preached in church. We're under giving. We're not under tithing. But these laws creep in when you get the two covenants confused. And sure enough, on divorce and remarriage, the two covenants were pushed into one. And Deuteronomy 24 was given far more uh, basis. It was on that basis, that, on the basis of the Mosaic law, that Calvin and Luther both insisted that adulterers be stoned or executed in some way or another. So the reformers interpreted Mark and Luke by Matthew instead of the other way round. They saw 1 Corinthians 7.15 as permitting remarriage after desertion. They saw adultery as deserving death and generally got confused between the old and the new covenant. I believe we are under the law of Christ. Christ. 
and that we read the Old Testament through his interpretation. Where he lays a law from Moses onto us, it is part of our obligation. But there are significant areas where he doesn't. On the Sabbath law alone, Paul says, Christians are perfectly free if one person wants to regard one day as special, they can. If another wants to regard every day as the Lord's day, they're free to do that. He said, don't let anybody judge you in respect of Sabbaths. And yet it's amazing how much Sabbatarian thinking is still in Christian minds, not least in the Keep Sunday special campaign. We really need to be clear in our thinking and say what laws in the Bible do apply to us and what laws don't. You all agree that circumcision doesn't, don't you? That we're not under circumcision law? Why not? It's in the Word of God? No, because Christ is in many different ways the end of the law to those who believe. Well, let's come to England now and see what happened in England during the next 300 years. Tyndale, first translator of the Bible in English, he who paid for his life with his life in Holland, burned to death for doing that, he introduced Luther's ideas on divorce and remarriage to England. However, in 1603, the revised canon law would not accept either divorce or remarriage, only separation from bed and board or annulment. However, the free churches, the Protestants, the Puritans, and ultimately the Westminster Confession, which is the creed of all Reformed Christians and churches, adopted Calvin's position and said that adultery must be treated in the Old Testament way, even though we don't stone the adulterer to death, that would have set free their partner to remarry. And if we don't do the punishment, we must still regard the person, the innocent person, as set free. The adulterer is as good as dead. See, that's written into the Westminster Confession. There were those who carried it even further. John Milton, you've heard of? wrote a book, The Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce, the most liberal of all. He said, Christ is concerned with injury and violence in marriage and not just adultery. That's an argument still used today. And the right of divorce by mutual consent must be recognized. In other words, if two husband and wife agree to be divorced, that should be accepted. And so I come to the 20th century where are we now? The state laws are now very liberal. Divorce has become easier and easier in the Western world. Away from its roots in Judeo-Christian thinking. Secular thinking has taken over. The Enlightenment has won. And England is quite typical of many other countries. It used to be the case until 1857 in England there was no legal divorce and therefore no legal remarriage. In 1857, or oh by the way, I, I was wrong there, there was no legal divorce except for Act of Parliament. The only people who could give a divorce were Parliament. You had to go to the House of Commons and persuade them to debate your marriage, to get it. The result is they were very few and they were very, very expensive. You had to pay all the MPs for an extra session to get an Act of Parliament. That, of course, goes back to Henry VIII, who got Acts of Parliament for his divorces. And that was the case until 1857, 150 years ago. No divorces, no remarriages, unless by Act of Parliament, which put divorce and marriage right out of the picture. 1857, one ground was introduced, adultery. The legal term was matrimonial offence. From then on, you could get a divorce in the courts on the grounds of your partner's adultery. And unfortunately, of course, many people did deliberately. It became almost a joke that you went to Brighton for the day, or rather the night, and an obliging chambermaid was found in your bed the next morning, 
and you have the legal grounds for a divorce and you could get out of your marriage. It, it was a common occurrence. And legally from then on, if you could, you could literally get out of your marriage by committing adultery yourself. Do you, do you follow me? If you wanted to get away from your wife, you went to Brighton, got the chambermaid, came back, presented your wife with proof, statement by the porter, and uh, you could get rid of your wife. And you were free to remarry. But that was 1857 onwards. In 1937, now to me, that's yesterday. You know, I'm afraid I'm getting on. <laughs> but uh, 1937, when I was seven, now you can all do your maths. Uh, the grounds of desertion, cruelty, and incurable insanity were added. Not just adultery, but desertion, cruelty, and incurable insanity were added. So there were now more grounds. Furthermore, there had been nullity all the way through. And now the grounds of nullity were extended also. There were more reasons why your first uh, marriage could be annulled. No clergyman was compelled to solemnize remarriage, but any clergyman could. And that is still the case. Many vicars hide behind their bishop, but in fact, a vicar is free to conduct a remarriage in church by canon law, though very few do. In 1966, there was a report from the archbishop's group called Putting Asunder, which proposed one ground for divorce, namely irretrievable breakdown. In other words, if the marriage has died, is as good as dead, they're free from it. And in fact, that suggestion of the Archbishop's group was incorporated in the Divorce Reform Act of 1969. And incidentally, I was in a group with John Stott and others who represented a Christian viewpoint to the government for the Divorce Reform Act in 1969. It seems like history now, but I was involved in the discussions there and tried very hard to uh, put the Christian viewpoint. But I'm afraid the Christians present were divided in their opinion, which doesn't help. Eventually, there was divorce by mutual consent after two years, or with only the consent of one after five which has virtually brought about a situation in which divorce is freely available, which is why nearly half the marriages in England end in divorce. It is a massive situation now. And it's as the legal situation has got easier, divorce has become easier too. And it becomes now the point has been reached now where people, very few people raise eyebrows at people getting unmarried, demarried, divorced, or even not getting married at all. We're in a very new situation. And alas, the heroes and heroines of society are sometimes the worst at switching partners. And almost every day you read in the papers of yet another prominent person in politics or the media or entertainment or sport uh, changing models again and who are the latest Liz Hurley and whatever and so it goes on until now it is simply accepted well if it didn't work out try again and the illusion is very widespread that you're more likely to make a good marriage the second time than you did the third, first time and the third even more because you're learning you're learning better how to choose statistically it's exactly the opposite you're twice as likely to have a second marriage breakdown as the first. Funnily enough, those statistics don't apply at all in second marriages where the partners died. Isn't that interesting? There's something about the partner still living which uh, can even draw unfavorable comparisons with the second marriage because there were some things in the first partner that were better than the second. They were bound to be. <laughs> You're not going from a totally hopeless person to a totally marvellous 
And so divorce statistics have shot up in the 20th century. Now, where do the churches stand in all this? The Catholic Church has maintained its position, its medieval position. Marriage is still indissoluble. Annulment is allowed on 19 grounds, but there's a strong court to decide, and there's an immensely complicated procedure to get through but people can get through it, but that's the Catholic position. The Orthodox is still uh, more liberal than the Western Church, but it still abides by the traditions of the medieval period. That set the course. The Anglican Church is in a muddle. Henry VIII wrote against Martin Luther, a book that so pleased the Pope that he gave Henry VIII the title Defender of the Faith meaning the Catholic faith. That's just a little bit of information you may not know, but that's what the title means. And uh, the Church of England has wavered between Catholic and Protestant ever since and doesn't know really which it is. So it tends to have a high wing, a broad wing, and a low wing. The low wing very Protestant, the high wing more Catholic than, Anglo than Roman Catholics, and the broad lot in the middle who tend to be liberal. 1938, there were resolutions passed and an act of convocation in 1957 finally said no remarriage in church. And that's pretty well consistently the position held since. The high church, high Anglicans, say no remarriage at all. They take more the Catholic line. And most of the high church Anglican scholars say Matthew 5 and 19 are not Jesus' words at all, but uh, Matthew's. The low church consistently follow Erasmus and take the Erasmus line of two exceptions, though they have a real battle maintaining it there. The broad church, following two influential reports called the Root Report and the Litchfield Report, are taking a much broader line altogether. And the pressure from that middle broad group means that the Synod of the Church of England this year is going to review their whole attitude to divorce and remarriage. So it's a hot issue for the Church of England right now. There is no single Anglican position. The free churches have been most influenced by liberal theology and ethics and therefore become the most liberal in practice about remarriage. Traditionally, they held the Erasmian position, but a lot of them don't now. Both have learned how to stretch the loophole. Uh, how do you stretch it? Well, you take the exception of adultery and you say it doesn't need to be the ground of the divorce as long as it took place. If there was adultery before the marriage ended, then that's enough to set you free. Or, more common, there has been adultery since we separated. So I'm free. It wasn't the ground of the divorce at all. It just becomes an excuse for getting a divorce. Then there are those who say mental adultery is a ground for divorce. My husband looks at magazines. There are those who say spiritual adultery. And I could name a leading Christian whom most of you would know in this country, a leading Christian ministry, who has divorced his wife because he felt she didn't share his vision for ministry and faith and therefore was, in Old Testament terms, guilty of spiritual adultery. That's how he's justifying what he's done. Or take the desertion. It was first of all said that an unbeliever deserting sets you free, then it was a believer deserting who sets you free, and now it is being said, a believer may do the deserting and is set free for a remarriage. I could give you chapter and verse for that too. As well as stretching the two exceptions until they became about a dozen, there has been added to them a whole lot of other grounds. I've mentioned cruelty, and insanity and many pastors tell me now that they feel that a wife who's been abused physically and had to leave for the sake of the children's safety maybe is now free to remarry uh, furthermore there is now the thinking but 
if the innocent party of a divorce over adultery may remarry, why may not the guilty party remarry? Surely forgiveness should set the guilty party free as well. If they've repented of it and truly been forgiven, shouldn't the guilty party also be remarried in church? There is a new thinking about marriage as a covenant, which then teaches if the covenant is broken down, both partners are now free. That the very nature of a covenant is that it involves commitment, and where the commitment has gone, the covenant has disappeared. Then there is this word ideal again. Jesus was not laying down a law, he was holding before us an ideal. What a dangerous word that is. It immediately implies it's not practical. We're not in an ideal world. Then a theologian called Fletcher has introduced what he calls situational ethics. And what he means is that you don't start with principles, you don't start with right or wrong, you start with the situation. And you decide what is best in the situation. It's not what's right or wrong, but what will do more harm or less harm. You choose between the lesser of the two. He teaches that the only absolute principle in Christian behavior is love. And therefore, in every situation, you ask, what is the loving thing to do? There is no other absolute principle. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Not, you'll just love, but you'll keep my commandments. All of them. And relativism is now the atmosphere in which most things are discussed. There are no absolutes anymore, no true or false, but just what you think is true for you and what I think is true for me. What you think is good for you and what I think is good for me, that's relativism. No absolute that's right or wrong outside us, but just what we think is right or wrong, or more frequently what we feel is right or wrong. And the idea that God is love, and that's all, is now pervasive everywhere. I'm speaking a lot about this. That God is righteousness. But the idea that God is only love has led to this kind of question, and I've been asked it. Wouldn't God prefer a loving second marriage to a hating first one? Now you disentangle that question and just you know, analyze it a bit. What's it really asking? God is love. He wants us to experience love. He wants us to be in a loving marriage, whether it's the first, second, third, fourth or fifth. The important thing is that the marriage be loving. Is that really a valid interpretation of what Jesus said? Or to put it even more crudely, doesn't God want us to be happy? And I tell people, God's plan for us is to be holy here and happy hereafter. Whereas most of us would rather it were the other way around. We want to be happy here and holy later. We don't mind being holy in the future. But we do want to be happy in the present. Well, if I understand the Beatitudes, or what Billy Graham calls the Buddhaful Attitudes, it says, oh, how happy are the holy. And that's the way round. But the problem is now that there is no consistent preaching or practice, especially in the free churches of Britain. And soon that will include the state church. And even in the not too far distant future, the Catholic church. We just cannot rely on the church speaking with one voice, even local churches speaking with the same voice. So that the result is that we have supermarket Christians we have people who come to a church and say, we want to be remarried, will you remarry us? No. And they simply go down the road to another church that will. And therefore discipline becomes very difficult. Setting a standard of behavior becomes almost impossible. When the real people undermining any stand you take are your fellow Christians and other churches. That's the situation in which we are. Nevertheless, I believe in that situation, we are still responsible to our head, who is Christ. And within the sphere over which we have control, then we need to apply discipline, whatever other churches do about it.
if a member is disciplined in this church and welcomed in the next one, 100 yards away, that is the responsibility of that church. But we each in our own situation, in our own sphere, have a responsibility first for my own life and then for the community to which I belong in Christ, for setting the standard where we believe it ought to be set. And that brings us to the third section, which we're going to after we've had a break. But let me just try and summarize briefly what has been happening over 2,000 years. The first thing that strikes me is that overall, the trend has to become more liberal, more lax in standards. It's not got tighter over the 2,000 years. It's gone the other way. Discipline has almost disappeared from most church life. And yet it was once regarded as one of the fundamental marks of a church, that disciples were disciplined, that standards were set for members, and that they were rebuked and corrected when those standards were flaunted. Secondly, over the 2,000 years, churches have tended to follow state legislation. That in fact, when a church follows the world, the standard goes down. Uh, with the Orthodox Church, I've told you, it was when they accepted Justinian's, the Emperor Justinian's attitude, that they became uh, more free about this. Um, but as the civil law in England has relaxed, the churches have relaxed too. And I just pose the question, should the church be leading the world or should the world be leading the church? Should we be leading people up the hill to God or following the world downhill? My impression is that the church follows the world 15 years after everybody else. And that things that were not acceptable in the church 20 years ago are now freely accepted. And we're not following the spirit in that. We're following the spirit of the age. Fourthly, the sheer variety of view is now our biggest handicap. There are now actually, I haven't gone through them all, there are now 11 distinct theological views on divorce and remarriage in this country. I could have gone through 11 different views, each quite distinct from the other, each justifying remarriage on different grounds. And that's a picture of where we are today. One of the reasons, I believe, why people are not being clearly taught or given any guidance. And it's fatal, as I'll say in the next session, it's fatal to try and set the standard when you're into a situation if it's not been set before. The situation will have too much pressure in it for you to take a stand. I've just found that in experience. If the stand isn't clearly set before you get into trouble, before you get into the mess, then you, the mess will take over and dictate what you do about it. And the final observation I would make is this, that it's very difficult to draw the line when you make any exceptions, because any become more. Very difficult to say, well, we'll allow this person to remarry, but not that person. And that can set up tremendous resentment and a feeling of inconsistency, even hypocrisy, or favoritism at worst. The whole local church needs to be clear on its stand so that no one leader is blamed for allowing this or not allowing that. A corporate stand is needed, at least in the local church, if it can't be obtained on a wider scale. Well, now that's a brief historical survey.